Sorry, I've been somewhat caught, caught out there. Um, well, good morning, everyone. And uh, <coughs> let me warmly welcome you all to worship this morning with, as ever, a special visit. Special welcome if you're visiting today. Um, hands up if you're a visitor. Oh, oh yeah, we, we have, have at least at least one. And uh, you are very welcome. As also those of you who join us via the live stream, you're most welcome. We're delighted to have you with us. Um, at this service, we'll celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And uh, visitors are most welcome from other churches, most welcome to participate with us in the sacrament. Um, at the close of the service, a congregational meeting will be held here in the sanctuary immediately after the service, and for that reason, tea and coffee will not be served downstairs today. But I'm going to invite uh, our session clerk, if he's around. He's there, <laughs> Crispin, to um, explain what this important meeting is about. Thank you, Angus, and good morning, everybody. Um, you will have received the notification of the congregational meeting if you are a member um, of the congregation or indeed an adherent. Um, just to be clear, for the voting, which is on three resolutions, uh, the basis of union, the basis of reviewable charge, and the basis of parish grouping, um, they will be held all at once, but the votes on the first resolution will be counted first because the second and third are contingent on it being in favour of the basis of union. Um, our presbytery representative at the meeting, who is here today, Rich Cordell, will provide uh, further instructions for housekeeping uh, immediately after the service. If you could please remain seated uh, if you wish to attend the meeting. Um, we'll move the table across. Uh, George Burgess, as our roll keeper, has a copy of the roll. If you want a precious ballot paper, or rather three papers, you are required to come up to the table just as you would, except if you go to a polling station, you come in the door. But it seems ri ridiculous to make you go out and come back in. But please come up to the table, get your name scored off, and you'll get given the ballot papers. I can see raised eyebrows. It is the way the Church of Scotland does things. Um, I think, Rachel? <laughs> Slightly bureaucratic is, uh, is uh, one interpretation of it. Um, <clears throat> First of all, I'm required to read a citation to the congregation yet again. It's different to the last one. And, and it will be, be different, different next week when I read it next week, hopefully. So, pending the meeting of this congregation after the service and approval of the basis of union with the congregation at Greenside, a basis of reviewable charge for the united congregation and a basis of parish grouping with the congregation of Broad and St Mary's, intimation is hereby given that at a meeting to be held in Palmerston Place Church on Tuesday, the 7th November, 2023, the Presbytery of Edinburgh and West Lothian will take up consideration of the report of the Deployment Committee when it will recommend that the Presbytery approve a basis of union for Greenside and St Andrews and St George's West, a basis of reviewable charge for the United Congregation and a basis of parish grouping with the Congregation of Broughton and St Mary's. The congregation are hereby cited to attend for their interests on 7th of November 2023 at 7.45pm in Palmerston Place Church. In the name and on behalf of the Presbytery of Edinburgh and West Lothian Deployment Committee, by order of the Presbytery of Edinburgh and West, Lo West Lothian, signed Dr Hazel Hasty, Presbytery Clerk. That's the official business, but equally officially and importantly, we're coming to the end today of Angus's locum ministry over the past 
10 months. When you initially came to us, I think you didn't quite envisage it might be 10 months, but uh, apparently you so enjoyed yourself that it has been 10 months. Um, I hope you'll permit me to say just a few words to you. Angus, we've been truly blessed to have you as our local minister for almost a year. When you bounced ticker-like into our church life at the beginning of January, you found us in a state of flux and uncertainty, to put it mildly. We were in urgent need of a calming presence, a steady pair of hands. What you have gifted us over these past 10 months is that and far, far more. Back in January, in recognising that state of flux and uncertainty at St Andrews and St George's West, the then recently published Presbytery Mission Plan had decreed that our position needed clarified before we were ready to join in the process of uniting and growing with other congregations. We find ourselves today deciding exactly that, whether we wish to unite as soon as practical with the congregation at Greenside and enter into a grouping with Broughton St Mary's. That we have got to this place of renewal and hope is in great part down to your gentle leadership and guidance, Angus, ably assisted by our interim moderator, Gordon, to whom we will be bidding farewell next week. Leadership can mean many things, but in your case, it has certainly involved throwing yourself enthusi enthusiastically into the life of St Andrews and St George's West, striding out with the walking group frequenting the Undercroft Cafe and making sure to get to know each daily team of volunteers, studying alongside and lending your erudition to the book group, and your hospitality, more reason to stop at Morrison's. Sorry about that joke. <coughs> Talking of the book group, they will know that you penned a vivid introduction to their current read, The Pilgrim's Progress. I read a short quote from that introduction. From the outset and throughout, we find him incorporating, in a quite brilliant manner, biblical ideas, verses and imagery. It's as if his mind and imagination are completely marinated in scripture. He seems in command of the whole biblical canon and able to use it effortlessly for his purpose. C.H. Spurgeon once remarked, that if you pricked the very reverend Dr. Angus Morrison, sorry, sorry, Bunyan, Bunyan, his blood will flow bibline. It's an aspect of his genius. Angus, we've been treated to tantalizing clips of that scriptural genius week by week in your eloquent, extravagantly illustrated sermons, delivered in a way that is instantly approachable and peppered with your great throwaway lines and infectious chuckle. We look forward to their publication in a best-selling book, one of your many next projects, perhaps. Angus, you will be very much missed. Come back soon. Well, Christopher, thank you so, so much for that kind and generous uh, statement and um, I'm rather overwhelmed by what you said. I, I, I'm not usually speechless, but I'm speechless now. Thank you very, very much. It's been an absolute delight for me to have been with you over these months. It's been one of the happiest of times in ministry for me and, and getting to know you wonderful people has been such a privilege. So thank you for having me, and um, am I going to say it now? <laughs> um, a little development that um, Crispin didn't mention, um, he wants me to mention it, and that is that <clears throat> from the 1st of February next year, this may either please you or appall you, uh, from the 1st of February next year, I shall resume my role here as locum, for an indeterminate period. And as you see... <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
as you seek a new minister. So um, no one's looking too shocked. So, so thank you again for, for everything. Oh, you won't necessarily always get me here. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all very, very much indeed. That's so kind. I think I need to mention something else, and that is that we want to congratulate Jennifer Spears. Um, you'll see from the notes, if you've read them, Jennifer um, has won at the Royal National Mod and Coleman Gaylor's coveted Sarah Weir Memorial Trophy in the solo singing Mother and Iona mixed competition. That is a remarkable achievement. She As someone who knows a little bit about the Gaelic world, I know that she was competing as a former gold medalist, am I right? Oh no, who you were competing against? Oh, she, she beat a gold medalist. Well, that's pretty good. So, well done, Jennifer. We're absolutely delighted. Our call to worship, let's get on for we'll be all day. Um, our call to worship based on words from John 13. Jesus has given us a new commandment. Just as Christ has loved us, by this everyone will know we are Christ's disciples. Come, let us join our hearts in worship. We stand to sing our first hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
the first of our lessons this morning come from Philippians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 11. Imitating Christ's humility. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. The second lesson comes from the Gospel of John. John chapter 17 and verses 20 to 24. Jesus prayers for his disciples. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all become one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely loved, completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory which you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Amen, and thanks be to God. Amen. We stand to sing our next hymn, 443. He is Lord, he is Lord, he is risen from the dead, and he is Lord, we stand to sing.
Bless us, O Lord, in our reflections, together grant that through the written word and the spoken word we may know and follow your living word, Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. I'm sure many of you are glancing at the theme um, title on the screen, Imitation of Christ, would have been instantly reminded of uh, the title of a book published in the Netherlands um, in the 15th century, The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis, written originally in medieval Latin. Um, it's recognized as a religious classic like Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, to which reference was already made, its readership and influence have been enormous all around the world. In part, the inspiration for Akemis' book came from the extraordinary passage uh, in Philippians 2 that was read to us. It's maybe not surprising that for my last sermon for now, as your lo current local minister, I should gravitate to Paul's happiest letter. Uh, I found these months with you both happy and fulfilling. And again, thank you so much for all your kindness and your patience and your encouragement. As I say, Philippians is easily the happiest of Paul's letters. It may just be the happiest book in the Bible. What is the single dominant theme of Philippians. It's not what you might have expected from a letter written in prison. Well, this letter's principal theme is joy. There are no fewer than 16 explicit references to joy in the book. A joy rooted in Jesus Christ himself, enhanced in prayer, and by the gospel's advance. Paul speaks of his own joy in these realities, and he repeatedly calls on the Christians at Philippi to rejoice too. And it's important to recognize that Paul saw in this church at Philippi nothing less than the workmanship of God. And that's what we have to see in every Christian church and congregation. It was a work begun, but not yet completed. It was a work in progress, of course. He's writing to a Christian community, which, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his life together points out, is not a human ideal. It's a divine reality. And God chooses to form his communities in places of pain and hurt and sin, which is why, as Bonhoeffer says, we must always keep focused on Jesus Christ himself. He, he it is who calls us by his Spirit into the fellowship of his one body to be formed together into his image and likeness. In terms of the current moderatorial theme, the church is meant to offer the clearest possible manifestation of the meaning of Ubuntu, that uh, South African term. I am because you are. Paul's great desire is to deepen the Philippians' joy, and he sees his unity for what it is, a negative, life-quenching, joy-undermining force. Besides, probably nothing undermines gospel witness in the world more than conflict and his unity among Christians. That joy-filled uh, wheelchair-bound quadriplegic Joni Erickson Tada put well the, the challenge we all face as Christians together. She says, believers are never told to become one. We already are one, and we're expected to act like it. Jesus, the night before he died, the night in which he instituted the supper, prayed fervently for the oneness of his followers, may they all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That's the missional implication of our unity. We just need to recall Paul's first three converts in Philippi 
You read about it in Acts 16. What a mixed group this predominantly Gentile church constituted. The first three, there was, a, there was an Asian businesswoman, there was a Greek slave girl, and there was a Roman prison governor. What, what community but the Christian church could bring these three together as one? But that's exactly what the church is intended to do and to be. The church is being true to its nature when it relativizes all the distinctions, whether of class or ethnicity, culture or gender, material wealth or poverty, so often used to drive a wedge between people and keep them apart. In this way, the church models and provides an advanced sign of the ultimate unity of all things in Christ. And that's why in our passage, Paul begins with a heartfelt plea to his friends to value and demonstrate this unity, to give him joy by having the same love and being in full accord and of one mind. He's not referring to the kind of imperious group thing which, with which we've sadly become too familiar. It can happen in the church when authoritarian, self-absorbed leaders refuse to allow diversity and unity or the proper exercise of freedom for which, as Galatians say, Christ has set us free. And the outcome of that is invariably destructive of the church's unity. We need constantly to heed the words of an otherwise obscure Lutheran theologian. In a tract he wrote uh, during the Thirty Years' War of 1618 to 1648, quote, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. So in one of the richest passages in the New Testament, possibly quoting, as some scholars think, a hymn of the early church, Paul comes to what is at once his prescription for joy and his cure for such maladies in the church as that of disunity. It's a prescription and a cure that puts Jesus himself exactly where he should be in our hearts and minds and motivations right at the center. And this is Paul's core exhortation. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. He's urging Christians to think the way Christ thought in what someone described as the most sublime Christological passage in the New Testament. Paul spells out exactly what the mind of Christ looks like. And it's an antidote to the me virus, the vain conceit and selfish ambition against which he warns. And it embodies that humility that counts others more significant than yourselves. Reading these verses, we feel maybe something like Alice in Through the Looking Glass as she slipped through a mirror in the sitting room and found herself in a strange new world on the other side where everything seems to operate on different and unfamiliar principles. What we see in Jesus Christ, says Paul, is the perfect model of a fundamental principle of God's kingdom. The principle that the way up is the way down. It's the way of perfect humility in which Jesus' mind is centered first on his Father and then on us in complete self-abnegation. The main point in the passage is that the movement it traces step by step leads from the highest conceivable place to the lowest conceivable place. And it's a revelation of the mind of Jesus Christ. You can't get higher than where it begins in, he was in the form of God, an expression which carries the sense that he possessed inwardly and expressed outwardly God's very nature. There is mystery in all his language, of course, but it's saying unmistakably that the full glory of the eternal God was Christ's. Now, here was his mind. He did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped or better maybe exploited. He was not thinking of any advantage or gain of his own by using his glories for self-display. What was he thinking about? He was thinking about his father and the obedient doing of his will, and he was thinking about us. 
beloved sinners are and the world's salvation. And the sequence follows his downward steps from the highest to the lowest place. He emptied himself, not by losing anything, but by taking the form of a slave. His mind was not to be served, but to serve. And in the very humblest possible sphere of service. Here it is explicitly, born in human likeness, found in human form, he humbled himself. The lowliest meekness and the highest majesty in perfect harmony in Jesus Christ. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a, a cross, a form of punishment reserved for the lowest of the low, like slaves and brigands. All wonder and praise are the responses we should feel as we touch this holy ground where the God we worship has revealed himself to be the God of self-giving, self-emptying love. Between these two poles, being in the form of God and the death of the cross, there is a downward journey of inconceivable distance and depth. Vividly dramatized in that upper room scene, you recall that Jesus got up from the table, divested himself of his outer robe, and furnished with a basin and towel, stooped down to wash his disciples' feet. But for Paul, this is not just mind-stretching and glorious theology. It's the very reason why beloved Christian people like Euodia and Syntyche should wrap up their squabbles. The reason why the only appropriate and acceptable route for all of us in the Church of Christ is that route chosen by our Master and Lord, the path of humility, service, self-renunciation, the route that leads to the great goal for which Christ prayed, our unity for the sake of a lost and a fragmented world. Because in face of our Lord's incredible self-giving love, we realize that love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. And for choosing the humble way, our Lord Jesus was given the greater glory, indeed, the highest glory. One day at his name, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Jesus Christ, we may be sure, will not be slow to honor his humble servants who have no higher ambition than to offer lowly service for his sake. Paul's joy and theirs in Philippi and ours today too as followers of Jesus is found in the unity of love which is evident when each is prepared to embrace the mind of Christ our Saviour. And we all know that in coming days we're all going to have to work more closely together than ever before in our various partnerships in the gospel. We cannot go it alone. We, and we have so much to receive from as well as to offer to one another. And in facing the challenges that do lie ahead, it is hard to think of a better place to start than these words of the Apostle Paul in our passage today. And as we start to come around the Lord's table, let us remember that this supper, in Augustine's words, is the sacrament of our unity. It was given by Jesus to his followers to help bind them to himself and in so doing to unite us to one another in love and service as the one body of Christ. We eat and drink the bread and wine together, feeding on Christ by faith through the Holy Spirit's gracious activity. The church, wherever it's found, is a community of imperfect people like me, like you. People on pilgrimage, in which we're all learning step by sometimes reluctant and painful step that our truest identity is in Christ. And what that means for our relationship to one another 
as people whose calling is to follow and to serve our humble Lord. It's a message with which we never and over find ourselves more clearly presented than at the table of the crucified Lord. Here we are summoned to follow him in identifying with the lowly and the needy and in giving ourselves away in humble service to a broken, suffering world. So doing, we truly honour the name that is above every name. Let the same mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand to sing our next hymn, 374 in the hymn book. From heaven you came, helpless babe. Our prayers of the people, uh, when we say, uh, just as Christ has loved us, please respond with, may we show our love for one another. Loving God, we thank you that you are a God of such abundance and gracious love. We lift before you a world deeply in need of love and care. We pray for all those caught up in the conflict in Israel and Palestine, that there may be an end to killing and suffering and hatred, that hostages may be released unharmed, 
that humanitarian aid may flow to everyone who needs it, that all those who have fled their homes seeking sanctuary may find protection and comfort, and that all parties may work together to find a way to a just and lasting peace. Just as Christ has loved us, may we show our love for one another. We pray for people in other parts of the world where there is war and the shadow of war. For Ukraine, Afghanistan, Central African Republic, Chad, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Myanmar, Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. Help all those involved to see the humanity in one another and to seek peace with justice. Just as Christ has loved us, may we show our love for one another. We pray for people who are affected by natural disasters and the effects of climate change. Bless all relief efforts and help us to play our part in limiting climate change and in supporting the vulnerable to adapt to its consequences. We pray for all who suffer injustice and persecution and for those who bear responsibility. Lord, all people are one in you. Lead us to seek and to strengthen the good in one another. Just as Christ has loved us, may we show our love for one another. We pray for all those in need of our own society, those without homes, people experiencing illness or bereavement, people who are marginalized and discriminated against, and for everyone who feels as though they cannot cope. Bring comfort and rest and guide them to sources of help. Just as Christ has loved us, may we show our love for one another. Finally, we pray for our own church and congregation. Guide us in the discussions and decisions we will face as we move towards union with other congregations. Help us to see the wider picture within and across denominations as we seek to act as the one body of Christ in the world and to spread the good news through word and action. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We come to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. We sing our communion hymn number 19. Ye gates, lift up your heads on high.
gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Let us celebrate this joyful feast. People will come from east and west and north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. Let us pray. The Lord is here. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our duty and delight always and everywhere to give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, Eternal and Holy Father. You created the heavens and the earth. You made us in your image, and in countless ways you show us your mercy. For all your goodness to us, known and unknown, we give you thanks with the Church Universal, and with the whole company of heaven we praise you in the angels' hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We bless you for the gift of Jesus Christ, born of Mary, eating with sinners, dying on the cross, risen from the dead. By the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, bless and consecrate these gifts, so that the bread which we break may be for us a sharing in the body of Christ, and the cup which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ, for the forgiveness of sins and the hallowing of all our lives and work. Receive us, O God, as together with our praise we offer to you our very selves. And as Jesus taught us, we say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We do this as Christ appointed. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it and said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this, remembering me. In the same way, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do it, remembering me. Jesus, Lamb of God, Jesus, bearer of our sins. Jesus, redeemer of the world. If the elders could come forward. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you. Do this, remembering him. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink from it, all of you. Blood of Christ shed for 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 you. Blood of Christ shed.
please come forward to receive the elements.
I hope, hope no one, one has been left out. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Great is the mystery of faith. Remembering all the witnesses and martyrs of the faith, and in communion with our sisters and brothers who have fallen asleep in Christ. Gracious God, you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us and renewed us for service. Help us who have shared Christ's body and blood to be his faithful disciples so that our daily living may be part of your kingdom and our love be your love reaching out into the life of the world. Amen. We sing as our closing praise the familiar words of the 23rd Psalm. Susan remarkably remembered that I really like it sung to the tune, The Bays of Harris, favorite tune of mine, maybe partly because my ancestral roots are firmly planted there. So I'm grateful for being indulged with the tune. So we stand to sing to the Base of Harris, the Lord's my shepherd, Anna Wong. Now may God, who has begun a good work within you, continue that work until the day when Christ Jesus returns. The God who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and evermore.
to the beat. Stop.